one of my favorite movies, and I don't use that term lightly, is The English Surgeon. I'm here with the director, uh, award-winning filmmaker, Jeffrey Smith. And uh, Jeffrey, this is a hell of a movie. I really enjoyed it. And uh, um, I would sort of prefer that you give just a brief synopsis of it so I don't uh, contaminate the viewer from, uh, you know, this is, we're, in the, we're maintaining the surgical field here. So. <laughs> um, the English Surgeon's a, a feature documentary, and it's, it's sort of shot, cut, structured like a feature film. It's, it's very um, moving, and it's full of characters that you're going to get very close to. Um, largely, it's, in the bigger sense, it's one man's struggle to do good things in a, in a selfish world. And in a way, I think that's why it connects with everybody, because we all, in our own small ways, are trying to do that every day. The, the, the character in question, though, he's... Um, his abilities lie in not only being able to save people, um, uh, and, but to make decisions about their future, um, but also, rather tragically, he knows he can also cost them their lives. That's the, the sort of central nub of the problem. Um, and he's, he's good enough as a surgeon to let me into that world, and obviously we can go on a journey with him then. Uh, but it is, as you say, it, it's a very, very moving film, and it's all the more so because it's actually true. <laughs> all these things did happen. And, you know, as it develops, and the surgeon is a very generous, very kind guy, and the, um, the country that it, it was shot in, um, Ukraine. the Ukraine, I was unaware of the, um, well, they have these um, hospitals that are run by f former KGB people, and everybody knows the KGB don't do any harm, they're good guys, and uh, when they're not opening up McDonald's out there, they're running hospitals. But the hospitals are probably w the most poorly equipped. Uh, no method of visualizing any any tumors, be they benign or, or cancerous. And the surgeons have to, the neurosurgeon, one, um, doesn't even have the proper uh, burrs to go in into the skull. Yeah. And when you see in the United States and in England and other places, uh, the surgeon, the English surgeon obviously is from England, they have these burrs that are disposable. They're, I think, 80 pounds a piece, and they use once, and they're pitched away. And this fella goes out of the recycling bin of the hospital, and he's a, a, a consummate woodworker, so he knows, uh, exactly. you know, from tungsten carbide bits and all that other <laughs> stuff. And he's able to remove uh, a shunt or remove a sleeve from it to make it... Uh, last for one bit last to 10 years yeah, right yeah exactly exactly and these things are thrown away and other countries uh, outside of of the of the ukraine i'm pretty sure could use these bits for sure and you know here we're you know being green and recycling paper cups and in all these tin cans and everything but it's a tragedy and we see it in new york city where uh, an elderly person dies and they pitch away the wheelchair and the walker and the you know all that stuff that costs a fortune and uh, uh, it's really a, a shame it's a pity yeah, that there's no worldwide push to preserve these things it, uh, well the film might start one for sure I mean he's he's not only a humanitarian he's he's exceptionally practical and as you say it comes from being a very very good carpenter at home um, so what he what he's trying to do all the time is to rescue the things that get thrown out of the NHS or our, our health service in the UK and make them good in the Ukraine um, it even comes down to the fact that they use a, a, a handyman drill from yeah, the that hardware they purchased store. In a, at the, at the, sh at the, at the market. marketplace, yeah. They don't have a proper surgical drill, so they use a $50 Bosch drill, which goes into you know, the patient's and head. And it's a lot slower. It's a 24 volt. It's a <laughs> yeah, and the battery runs out in the middle of the procedure. I mean, you so it's not exactly... Um, <laughs> you couldn't make this stuff up. Um, <laughs> and the patient's awake dare I say, on top of all of that. So yeah, what, what you notice is, and the movie uh, is very interesting because uh, I guess people realize that the, the brain has no pain sensors in it direct, just the scalp mm. and you know, portions of the skull. And so that if they do a, a local an anesthetic, they can actually open a little window, drill the patient, uh, the, the surgeon describes you're gonna feel noise and pressure, and it's this drill as if you were drilling through a piece of wood that has to be uh, realized in four locations so that they can get yeah. the bone sore and, and to free it. And once he's in, the surgeon has no uh, access to visualizing that tumor. He actually 
his skill depends on his tactile skill yeah. and what he sees through a very narrow opening uh, into the brain. And he needs to have the patient awake because uh, if he uh, sort of uh, goes uh, a, a millimeter uh, in either direction, that patient could be paralyzed. And the patient that he worked on, a young fellow, was remarkable. remarkable. I mean, his, his, what he telegraphed during that whole thing and his respect for the surgeon was, was uh, unbelievable. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's a brave person who's going to put themselves into a sort of head brace and then stay awake whilst your head is actually drilled open and um, also to be psychologically speaking, to be filmed so in the, uh, uh, to boot <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, think that helped I really think it helped him it was a good it, distraction um, but he's still a remarkably brave man but Hen Henry as you were saying Henry does that so that the patient being awake mm -hmm. he can keep moving he can keep asking him to move so that Henry the surgeon can be braver about getting the tumor out and that's the, the point that the, pe the uh, surgeon's skill is uh, amplified by the patient, patient's trust. Yeah. So as long as the patient trusts the surgeon, he becomes actually braver and more skillful and uh, uh, more heroic because of this. And yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. What motivated you? Uh, what brought you uh, this story? What motivated you to make it? Uh, for, for completely different reasons. I've been going out to the Ukraine for over 10 years when I met Henry. Um, and uh, he'd been going out for his own surgical reasons for about the same period of time and you you rarely meet people who even know where the ukraine is let alone having been there so mm -hmm. not only did we we get on famously we made another film five years ago but we both said look you know we have to make this film mm -hmm. so i went out with him i did a couple of reconnaissance trips um it was enormously moving what was happening in that mm -hmm. hospital and how was it shot um we we shot with three cameras three hd cameras just over four weeks. It was a very fast shoot because it all takes place, or 90% of the film takes place in the Ukraine. Um, and there's so much that happens every day in those people's lives. Mm. He has literally tens of outpatients queuing up in the, in the hospital to see him. And they're all, they're all possible um, stories, some of them very tragic ones, which you see in the I film. I know, you, you touched upon, there was a young woman that was unbelievable. She beautiful young woman in her 20s and she uh, the the prognosis wasn't good no. but the thing that you see is that if it was under a regular situation these benign growths you know the longer they wait the worse it gets and the the, the brain uh, the tumor expands inside the brain and mm. the, the brain has nowhere to go I mean it's encapsulated in into the skull and you're damaging all that good tissue so uh, there were children. There was one that had a, a tumor that uh, was into the eye, to the orbital uh, region of the brain. And it actually, um, w the prognosis was awful. Yeah. And the surgeon, uh, unlike what we see here in the States where you refer to on and then the oncologist and then hospice care and all these wonderful things, that, the support system that we have, they don't mince words. They mm -hmm. actually say it. So the prognosis and the actual uh, all hope is dashed. Exactly. exactly. I mean, the only thing you have to do is go home and, and you know, the next couple of weeks uh, just make the patient comfortable as, yeah. as best you can. Mm -hmm. And money for 50 bucks to do a brain scan, they don't have. No. It's so tragic when you see it with that little girl. I mean, it, uh, set alongside all the tragedy, of course, though, is the hope. And that's why Henry keeps going out there. And the, the, the patient we follow is completely cured, mm -hmm. um, free from the shadow of death, had been told it was inoperable in the Ukraine until mm -hmm. Henry came out. So that's why he keeps going, and that's why we should all keep hoping that the well, world can be a It's a remarkable place. movie. It should be seen by all. And I think that it, it touched me uh, very deeply. It's an incredible movie, and, and uh, I'm, ver I'm really proud that you made it. I think it's a, a great piece. I'm looking forward to other things. Uh, what's in the hopper now? What are you making? Oh, I've been on this festival circuit for uh, quite a while, but I'm just starting to, to come up with some new ideas. It does take a couple of years between films before you can really... Well, I, I'm pretty really sure after going. doing that, you were pretty spent for a while. <laughs> no, emotionally. emotionally. Yeah, yeah for and sure. The, and the ratio, how much did you shoot? To Surprisingly little, um, given three cameras. We shot about 65 hours. Um, which is very That's little, um, you know, I just know what I wanted and everything worked. Um, mm -hmm. so the look is beautiful. Yeah. Was it bumped to 35? Not yet. We will when it gets theatrically distributed um, in the spring. It looked very good, very good. It's I also funny though, isn't it? I mean, it, it, alongside all the, 
the drama, dare I say, there's a lot of humor in there. There is. And it's you a, need it. Y yes. Yeah. And it's something that one, it, it's in your theaters. Uh, does it have distribution? It does, yeah. Indie picks um, springtime. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, that's great. So the, the, when, you, when it has that wide distribution, uh, certainly in the theaters or when you have a DVD at home, it's, it's worth seeing. It's, it's something really wonderful. And it... Uh, uh, it restores one's faith in humanity. It does, and that, that good is still being done. Like yeah. if we took some of the military expenditures and put it into that oh. thing, it would uh, solve the problem uh, within moments. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. But it's a great movie. I'm proud to know you. Jeffrey Smith, watch out for him. And the movie is The English Surgeon. Highly recommended. Go and see it. <laughs> Courtney Moorhead Balaker. The uh, director and screenwriter of this beautiful movie called Cute Couple. You know, and everybody, in every group, there's always a cute couple, don't you think? Right, absolutely. I never was in that group, but, uh, you know, <laughs> designated that. But there's always somebody that does everything right. Absolutely. But so, you know, they rescue kittens, they do all sorts of wonderful things, mm -hmm. and they're designated that. But... Like in anything in the animal kingdom, when somebody challenges that mm -hmm. position, it turns into like, it's kind of bloody, don't you think? Absolutely. And they don't become so cute anymore. Yeah, it gets interesting. Yeah. <laughs> what made you make this beautiful movie? It's a New York premiere, cute couple, 14 mm -hmm. minutes, short program. What yeah. made you make it? Well, um, my husband and I used to live in New York City. We live in Los Angeles now. And we would attend a lot of dinner parties where we noticed that exact dynamic that you just described where uh, a, a new couple that came into a group of yes. already established friends and relationships and they would be cute and perfect and wonderful um, until another couple that fit that same bill came into the, the social group and then all of a sudden they the were The fangs come out. Yeah, the fangs come <laughs> out, exactly. Another thing we noticed was it wasn't just the cute couple that uh, different couples secured a, a niche, like there was the, the intellectual couple that were usually like the right. academics right. in college oh, yeah. or, or you know, the funny couple or the artsy couple. And uh, so we kind of, uh, we thought that would be a fun topic to make a short film out of. So I wrote it and, uh, and there it is. And was Zach and Kendra, did you, the, the two principals, the two characters, mm -hmm. were they based on somebody that you knew, I mean, personally? Yeah, they were, um, or a compilation? They were just a compilation of, uh, of various cute couples that we had met in the past. So mm -hmm. I, they weren't based on particular people that I've met. I just sort of took attributes. So to now, what others. would you define as something that would be a sure fire thing to have if you wanted to aspire to be a cute couple oh. what would it take i mean do you have to go to like the film school or something well <laughs> having a really adorable job like running a nursery or designing baby clothes mm. or um zach who's one of the lead uh characters is an animator uh so it helps to have a, a cute profession but uh just be bubbly and lively at parties and, and okay. have zingers and uh and obviously dress is very important mm -hmm. in terms sure. of being cute i think polka dots help a lot yeah pink is pink, a good yeah, color yeah. even for men yeah Flo you know what was oh, it yeah. not floss it's that fluffy material whatever it is yeah yeah i got that <laughs> well that doesn't come in my size so i'm out <laughs> this is terrific i think uh, and your, your training how did you get involved in the film business i actually uh I'm trained as a theater director. Um, oh. uh, in London, I went to school and got my master's in theater directing, and I directed some off-Broadway plays in New York City. And then I decided to segue from theater to film and moved to Los Angeles about five years ago. Didn't know anything about films, really. I knew a little bit about TV and theater, but nothing about film production. Uh -huh. So I just sort of started at the ground level working as an assistant, moved up to a creative executive, spent time on sets as much as I could, learn how to make movies. So you learn by shot. doing? Just learn by doing it, yeah. And it beautifully shot, uh, wonderfully oh, done. Thank you. And, you know, it moves right along. And it kind of, um, as a short, it leads me to think that if you had a feature-length uh, project that you would do very well oh, doing it. thank now, you. Do you have anything that you kind of in the hopper that you'd like to do as a feature length? I do. Um, I'm actually writing a, a feature script right now. It's not based on Cute Couple, but it has similar themes about social dynamics mm -hmm. and, um, and how people uh, basically deal with their identity. Mm -hmm. um, 
I can't pitch it very well yet because I, I'm, it's just so early so on in the process. So you're still forming it. I'm still so. forming it. But I do have a screenplay that uh, a, a very talented writer by the name of Paul Lokander asked me to direct. And I guess that would be more of a, a dramedy. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a dramatic structure, but it's got a mm -hmm. lot of comedic elements. So I'm trying to get that made. If someone wants to get in touch with Courtney Moorhead uh, Balaker, yeah, is there a website or a company that they can reach you? Absolutely. The uh, website for my short is the cutest couple site dot com. The cutest couple cutest site. Cutest couple site dot com. So we've gone to the next, <laughs> the next evolution, revolution of this thing. I, I couldn't get cute couple. You can't get any cuter than that, right? Cute couple uh, was like a, it's like a dating website. <laughs> And I, I can imagine involved in that. Yeah, so I had to pick that one. Yeah, she's really cute. I mean, it's like kind of, oh my God, what happened? She's exactly. a nice dancer, yeah. what they used to say. Exactly. Well, it's been a delight having you. You're very well, thank cute. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I think that the movie's very cute. I appreciate that. And I think that uh, you'd have a grand time seeing it. And I think that if people want to get in touch with you, because you're, you have that stage training, and you certainly did a great job with this. Thank you. And uh, that, that the off-Broadway director credits, uh, you know, you have a whole slew of things that... Uh, yeah, really it was fun. I miss doing that, but... Uh, and you might, um, you know, it might be a situation that uh, people can get in contact you and uh, yeah, sort of uh, go on to a, a bigger project. And we hope to see you many years to come here, Courtney. Thank and you so much. With me now is Joseph Mann, the director of American Dream. It's a short playing at the festival. Congratulations. Thank you very much. So let's talk about your film, American Dream. Give us a little synopsis. All right. Well, um, it's about a little girl who her parents tell her that she has to move away because they can't afford to stay in their hometown. So she decides to rob a bank. And things don't quite work out as planned. But, you know, it uh, ends up working out for the best. Well, in these tough economic times, it's, yeah. um, it's kind of, you know, an interesting uh, take or idea on what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Uh, she starts out by selling lemonade, yes. which is very, very traditional for, <laughs> yeah. for certain uh, kids in certain communities. And she's an know? enterprising young lady. Let's just say that. Yeah. yeah. And, then, so, and then she turns to robbing <laughs> a bank. How did you yeah. come up with this idea? Uh, well, actually, it's... Uh, <laughs> I was being forced out of my house uh, when I was in college, and I was just like sitting around one night, just thinking, "How can I, how can I stop being moved out of my house?" And I thought, "Maybe I'll just rob a bank." And then I was like, "Oh, you're an idiot! Only like a ten-year-old would do that." And thus was <laughs> the movie was born. All right. Well, we, as we know, there's a lot of there are people out there robbing banks, and there's a lot of people yes. out. Yes, I recommend ages. this movie uh, if you'd like to know how to do it legally, because it, it works out really well. Um, as far as, as being forced out of your house, uh, <laughs> what kind of reception ha had you gotten when you told people this idea for, for your movie? I mean, mm, as I, as I yeah. said before, we're in tough economic times. And <laughs> how, so how, how um, do you react? Well, uh, people were a little skeptical at first uh, because it's a little girl trying to rob a bank. <laughs> but we try to make it as realistic as possible mm -hmm. and obviously throw in some, some fantasy there because she's, she's a little girl. But uh, the reception has been great so far. I can't believe people like it as much as they have. I can't believe I'm actually in the Hamptons Film Festival. It's really cool. Yeah. Well, you are actually a local, right? So yes, your, yes. your family is yes. from West Hampton. Yeah, so they, they have, yeah, yeah. We're, uh, we're out in West Hampton with the house there. and. Uh, it's just it was a great town to shoot in. Everyone was super friendly. We had uh, all the local parents come in and give us their kids for the day, and uh, it was great. The parents were very helpful, giving their kids um, rubber band guns and uh, lots of Coca-Cola. It was great. Tell, t <laughs> let's talk a bit about the, shoot, the shooting of the movie. Where, when and where did it take place? I mean, we know West Hampton, but specifically yeah. when and where for those who know the oh, area. Oh, it took place in uh, August of '06, mm -hmm. which is a long time. It was like a year finalizing everything, making it after we shot it. It was four days of shooting and then a year of <laughs> everything else. But we actually took over, we drove by this old abandoned bank uh, that my friend who helped uh, produce it actually just saw it and was like, that's, that's the, we have to shoot in there. As there's, and there, I thought there was no way. We called the owner and we're like, we'll fix it up and would you let us do it? And thankfully he said yes, we actually raised the market value of them. 
property so, anyway. So will, will viewers recognize it? Will people from the Hamptons recognize no, it? No, there's okay. no way. This, okay. is, this is a bank that was completely empty. We actually... Where, where, where was this? It's, uh, it's like right um, near the CVS. I don't know the exact address, but we actually... There was nothing in it. There was just a bank vault door, uh -huh. and we had to build... Uh, from plaster, all the um, s like security boxes and everything within 24 hours. It was crazy. Wow. Yeah. Now it sounds like you made a very expensive short. Yes. Okay, your short is about 16 minutes. Yeah. 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 Um, How much did it cost? Uh, it cost around thirty thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah, I spent a lot of time on 42nd Street. No wonder you were <laughs> homeless. Right, exactly, exactly, right. Uh, I had to rob a bank to make the movie about robbing the bank. Yeah, it's good. So you built, you rebuilt the interior of the bank. Yeah. And then how did you cast the film? Uh, we, we had a casting director, and um, she showed us like a whole bunch of, of, of little girls like that would be perfect for the part. And then the last one who came in just blew, blew us all away, and she happened to be her goddaughter. It was nepotism at its best. But um, yeah, Leah Umberger uh, just created this entire vault in 24 hours. She didn't sleep. She just worked on it overnight, and it was it was really incredible. And Leah was your set designer. Yeah, yeah, okay. she was great. Yeah. All right, and then so then you shot it in what did you say? Four days. We shot it over actually two and a half days, really. Two and a half days. And the little girl was sick for um, for a day and a half of it. Oh. Yeah. And then how long did it take you to edit it? Uh, editing took us around a month, but then we have like a lot of effects in it, like mm -hmm. uh, animation, because she's like daydreams throughout the entire thing, and uh, so that actually took the most time because I had no more money left, <laughs> and so we had to have people do it for, for free, and a lot of people really came through, and uh, it, it looks hopefully much more than thirty thousand dollars, but that's an incredible amount of money anyway. So what's next for you? Uh, well, right now I'm working in LA uh, on a couple of scripts, a pilot and a feature, uh, and so I'm just trying to concentrate on that. I wrote another one that was a kids movie, and now I'm writing a romantic comedy, so I'm just gonna keep on slugging it out in LA. Okay. It's sunny there. <laughs> it's nice. So the next, the next thing we can expect from you is a feature film as opposed to another short, or? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, can't really do too many of those, mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, hopefully the feature's next, but uh, we'll see. Any hints? Is it set out here, perhaps? <laughs> Actually, it's set in Manhattan. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I, you know, I love East Hampton. I love the Hamptons, but I just want a New York City movie. So, you know, what can I do? All right. Well, Joseph Mann. We have the Student Awards uh, film and the Hollow Tree, which is another one of my favorites uh, for two reasons. First of all, it was done by somebody at NYU. And that aside, it is a great, great movie. 28 minutes, and I'm here with Patrick Stewart, the maker of this wonderful movie. And I know the inspiration was a story that your grandfather used to tell you right. about this intriguing... Uh, well, I'm going to have you, because if I tell it, I might blow the thing. That's fine. So I'll have you do the thumbnail, okay, and then we'll get into it. Well, well growing up, uh, I grew up in uh, eastern Pennsylvania, and... Um, Every weekend, my grandfather would like to drive up to Penn State, big Penn State football fans. And uh, driving along the countryside, you were not allowed to fall asleep in the car with him. So you would always hear different stories. One in particular was a story about a certain tree that you would find in the deep, dark woods. And of course, this would happen as we were driving through the <laughs> deepest, darkest part of the trip. So you, you won't fall asleep doing right, that? Absolutely not. And <laughs> one of the premises was this sort of magical tree that you would find. and it would uh, have Your grandfather was an Alfred Hitchcock, was he? No, 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 no <laughs> absolutely not. Okay, okay. More of a Ford type of person. I oh, guess. okay, yeah. good, good. Um, so, but yeah, you would find this tree and it would provide you with whatever you needed to find home. So mm -hmm. I, that story was kind of brewing in my mind as I was growing up, even after my grandfather father passed away and it sort of stayed with me even as I went into film school and I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to to bring this story to life on film. Hmm. You know it's amazing how telling a, an innocent story to a child impacts uh, so deeply and that's why uh, you know it's wonderful uh, giving children all sorts of experience but there's nothing like storytelling to impact the child and the imagination and probably in your mind, as vivid as the movie is, probably your imagination of that story is even greater because the, the movie came out brilliant. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I know your training at NYU is exquisite because I know I'm still paying the tuition on so, you know, my sons, <laughs> but it's great. Uh, <laughs> but I give you the commercial for NYU. It's a great school. 
but when I look at it, and I know that the budget wasn't great, but the way you, first of all, you took over this uh, bookstore, and, and it was an active bookstore in Manhattan, right? And you actually were able to um, change it over that uh, into this mystical place. And it's one thing if it was built on a set, you can right. do it, and, and it'll be a static set. And you, but you would uh, set it up after the store closed, break it down uh, that, that evening or whatever, so the store could open as a, as a 21st right. century store and not notice that it was sent yeah. back to the mid, almost the Middle Ages type of a look. Right. Unbelievable. I mean, your set, your designer, the way you shot it, uh, the acting, everything is, is at the top of the thing. It's, uh, it, it, I, I'd rival it with, with uh, I'd put it up against anything that costs millions and millions of right. bucks. It's unbelievable. We, we knew we were on the right track when halfway through the shoot, um, Technicolor did all our lab work in dailies. Um, a guy from Technicolor called us up, and Technicolor never calls you up unless there's a problem. He calls us up and said how wonderful the footage looks and thought we were running on a $10 million budget. And then asked us what the budget was, and they're like, well, you got to subtract $9 million, $900,000 <laughs> to get to where our budget is. But we knew we were on to something in production when we started to get feedback you know, from the sets and from how everything was looking and how the footage was coming back that we had something that was, that was working on that level and trying to build this world. And unless you see it, and we're going to show a clip right after this interview so you get just a taste of it, and uh, probably a, a section of the making of if we can, if that's okay with you. But the idea of what it looks like is amazing, and you should be very proud of it. And, then, <clears throat> and this wasn't your maiden voyage. Is this like your, uh, was your maiden voyage into something like this? Um, and this NYU, magnitude? you're doing other stuff, but di different magnitudes, different things. The last film I did was a feature doc, so it was a totally different, you know, beast of its own, that one. This, this was trying to create something that looks like a studio had made it and spent, like you said, millions of dollars on with the student film budget and student crew and, you know, all the limitations that come with it being a student film. But the, uh, right across the board, from the way it was shot to the acting to everything was exquisite. I mean, uh, it's a testimony to your skill and I, I guess well, your I think training. Part of, part of it's also finding people that to work with that are as committed to the vision and see the story as mm -hmm. well as you do and, and want to put that extra time in because obviously there's the money isn't there so now you're digging into other areas like you know people who want to invest their own time and energy mm -hmm. into it and see something greater out of it. And it's 28 minutes which is um, a little bit longer than the usual student film. Absolutely. And the limit for NYU is 30 so we've, we were just pushing right that under. limit. Yeah. And uh, it's terrific, and I'm pretty sure at NYU it uh, won all sorts of acclaim. So it, uh, it w well, we're up. We have to enter it this year. It's it's coming around for the first run film festival in the spring. So we'll see how we do there. But well, I'm pretty sure you're going to sweep. Sure we'll, but yeah, uh, we should do all right. <laughs> <laughs> and and within our own uh, humble uh, HIFF, I think you're going to do very well as well. I, I I predict. But what is in the hopper? Any student film, any short, anything like this is a audition piece for something greater absolutely okay which uh, if uh, if i was a studio or uh, you know a, a bank that bank the bank rolled the budget for a motion picture i would be very confident that you can pull it but if you had your dream project to start on monday what would it be what would a, what would you like to do dream project would be the feature of this which a is a full length feature yeah, which is already written and um, the, 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 there's also a, a children's book that mm -hmm. i've been working on and writing so it would be to see those two things fully realized. Now, did, you, uh, did your grandfather have a chance to look at this? Mm -mm. No? No. Nope. He died before we even started working oh, on it. Oh, that's too bad, because I, I think that um, uh, certainly would have been very proud of this. And there's a, there's a lot of him in it, a lot of his sort very of good. style and, and way of, of, of things is, is sort of... Now, your throughout. siblings, uh, did you have a, a brother? I have an older brother, yeah. And was he in the back seat oh, listening yeah. to this? So yeah. what did he think? Oh, he loves it. He loves it. I mean, half the time we were fighting in the backseat. I mean, he's, well, only, he's only four years old. Right, let me, me tell so. you, as a parent, because I've done that too with my sons, and it's interesting that they, you know, they're uh, both in the business. Uh, the idea of keeping a child awake in the backseat is not any form of uh, uh, nothing unusual, but the idea is if they sleep during the day, and it stops them from fighting also, but if they sleep during the day, they're going to be up all night. So I guess the, the point of the matter is your grandfather was sort of hedging his bets. Right, so he's planning gonna, ahead, so yeah. to speak. And then you have a nice walk on the beach, and they sleep uh, right. soundly through the right. whole we night. We go to the football game, and we're done. <laughs> <you know? laughs> that, and you have a couple of hot dogs that have the nitrates in it. I've, You're good for, yeah. good for the rest of the evening. But this is a great movie. I highly recommend it. 
And uh, look, I look forward to more stuff uh, from Patrick Stewart. Is there a website? Yes. www.thehollowtree.com. All together, thehollowtree.com. 